Today's case is one that has been going on for over a year now. And honestly, it is one of the most frustrating cases that I have covered in quite some time. As I have researched it more and more, the lack of accountability, I guess you could call it, truly just shows within all of the details. And I truly feel as if this case needs more eyes on it so that people can finally be held accountable. Hey guys, I'm Annie Elise. This is 10 to Life. Let's get right into it. Our gut health is connected to our brain and controls everything, energy, mood, all of it. And taking care of our gut health is so important because our gut plays such a crucial role in our overall well-being. And that is where colon broom comes in. Colon broom is the key to a healthy gut and so much more. It's not just about cleansing the colon and reducing the risk of colon cancer. It goes way beyond that. Colon broom works as a prebiotic, nourishing our healthy gut bacteria and promoting a balanced gut environment. Now, my gut is never quite right. It always feels off, feels a little askew. And when I first tried colon broom, I not only felt better physically, but I also felt healthier internally, if that makes sense. Colon broom is here to support your digestive system and keep it running smoothly. It's like a breath of fresh air, but for your gut. You could say goodbye to bloating, digestion issues, and pesky problems like keeping regular. With colon broom, you'll experience a clean and regular intestinal tract like never before. It's almost like just hitting a reset button and giving your gut the care that it deserves. And guess what? You'll also notice a visible improvement in your skin health. Plus, it has even more benefits if you can believe it. By slowing down the absorption of sugar, colon broom helps lower the risk of diabetes too. Again, it's amazing just like how everything is connected back to your gut. And also, let's not forget about cholesterol because colon broom helps lower bad LDL cholesterol levels, ensuring that your heart stays healthy. Get colon broom with more than 65% off and claim my special offer plus an extra 10% off. Join our biggest sale yet and get six months worth of colon broom with up to 65% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Use my code 10 to life and get an extra 10 percent off your whole order. Click the link in the description below and grab your discounted batch of colon broom while stock lasts. So tend to lifers, let's all prioritize our gut health and give colon broom a try. It's time to take control of our well-being from the inside out. Your gut will thank you and you will feel amazing. Trust me, it will be a game changer. 16-year-old Susanna Morales was born on June 24th, 2006. She comes from a very tight-knit family. She lived with her mom, Maria, and her stepdad, Leo. Susanna was the baby of the family and had two older sisters, Jasmine and Jalissa, as well as a stepbrother who she loved, although she was especially close with Jasmine. In the summer of 2022, Susanna was living in Norcross, Georgia, and was a high school freshman. She attended Meadow Creek High School, where she was a cheerleader and was well-respected by the other students that she attended school with. Susanna was loved by all who knew her because of her kind and loving personality and how she treated others. Besides that, she was incredibly talented musically. She had an incredible singing voice and enjoyed teaching herself to play both the guitar and the ukulele. She thoroughly enjoyed spending time with all of her friends, and of course, she also enjoyed spending lots of time with her close-knit family. On July 26, 2022, at around 4 p.m., Susanna returned home after going to work with her mom for the day. Going to work with her mom was something that she would do to earn some extra money, especially since it was summertime and she didn't have to attend school. So after coming home, Susanna got ready and left for her friend's apartment around 6 p.m. She was wearing blue jeans, a yellow tank top, and white Crocs. Her friend lived in the Sterling Glen Apartments, which was about 0.9 miles away from where she lived with her family on Santa Ana Drive. When she got to her friend's apartment, she texted her mom to let her know that she had arrived and she was there safely. After spending a few hours with her friend, Susanna texted her mom around at 9.40 p.m. to let her know that she was going to be heading home soon. 
So she left her friend's house around 10 p.m., and she started her walk home. But time went by, and Susanna never made it home. Her mom continued waiting and calling her with no response. The next morning, when they realized that Susanna still wasn't home, her family was extremely worried. Susanna's phone was now off, which was even more concerning. She wasn't the type of teenager that wouldn't come home with no communication. Sure, she occasionally had the typical teenage snark with her family, but aside from that, she was just a good, well-rounded teenager. She kept in contact with her family whenever she would go somewhere. She also wasn't into the party scene, and she also had just possessed a very calm demeanor. She was responsible. She followed the rules. So naturally, her family became very worried about where she was when she didn't come home and when they couldn't get a hold of her. By 9 a.m., Maria was reaching out to the Gwinnett Police Department as it had been nearly 12 hours since anyone had heard from Susanna. But the police brushed off their concerns, telling them that they would need to wait 48 hours before she would be considered missing. Now, their reasoning for this was that teenage girls often go and run away with their boyfriends or they go out and party. So despite her family's pleading and trying to get the police to understand that Susanna wasn't that type of teenager, the police were essentially refusing to help until they hit that 48-hour mark. Now, what's so frustrating about that, too, is we know that the first 48 hours are typically the most important in a case, not only to rescue and recovery, but finding them safely, finding them at all. It's just, it is such a crucial time mark. So Susanna's family was not about to just let 36 more hours pass by and do nothing but hope that she would arrive home during that time. And with every minute, they were increasingly getting more worried, and they knew that something was out of the ordinary, and that time was of the essence. So with no police help, they essentially began their own search and investigation to find Susanna and bring her home. They began passing out flyers and asking anyone if they had seen her, posting on social media, and talking about her to anyone that would listen. Thankfully, one kind person stepped up and provided security footage that they had captured of Susanna walking toward her neighborhood after 10 p.m. The address where that video was captured is less than a minute from her neighborhood. So for Susanna's family, that was clear proof that she had every intention of coming home, and they took that back to the police department in hopes of finally receiving their help. But the police were still hesitant to help. For whatever reason, the case obviously didn't seem that important to them, which is absolutely ridiculous. Susanna's family seemed to have clear proof that she wasn't some rebellious teenager who was purposely avoiding coming home. So for them to blatantly disregard her family, begging for them to at least tell the public that she was missing, is infuriating. As if the surveillance video wasn't enough of a reason to be worried, phone location information was pulled. There's still some question on whether or not her family pulled her location data or if the police did it. From what I've been able to find, Susanna's family said that they did it. However, many articles are phrased in the way of the police being the ones to do that. However, they found that from 10.07 p.m. to 10.21 p.m., data from a location app on her phone showed her walking along Singleton Road. Then from 10.21 p.m. to 10.26 p.m., her phone data indicated that her last known location was Oak Lock Trace near Steve Reynolds Boulevard. I'm going to take us through the map of her whereabouts according to her phone. When you look at this map, the pink circle is right around Susanna's home, where she was heading according to the message that she had sent her mom. That red line shows around where the surveillance camera footage had captured her. The blue pin with the green circle around it is where her phone indicated that she was when it had last pinged between 10.21 p.m. and 10.26 p.m. Obviously, based on the map and the timeline, her family knew that there was no way that she had walked up to Oak Lock Trace near Steve Reynolds Boulevard. She had to have been in a car, and they also knew she wasn't walking there because she was clearly headed in the direction of home in the surveillance video, and there was no video of her turning back around and walking the other direction. 
At the end of the day, I know who took the steps to pull the data isn't important, but regardless of who was the one to pull the data, the police still didn't seem concerned by what the data showed. This left Susanna's family essentially on their own, with nothing but questions and frustration as to why her disappearance didn't seem to be a priority for the police department. For the next month, Susanna's family worked tirelessly to keep her name spoken frequently in their community and to follow up on any leads. But every lead was a dead end, and the police still thought that she was just a runaway. Thankfully, they did have the help of some news stations. Telemundo Atlanta was the first one to cover the story. They began posting about Susanna starting on July 28th, and they were a huge help in getting the word out around the local Hispanic community due to their news station being a Spanish-speaking one. Her family continued posting on social media and reaching out to anyone that they thought could help. It wasn't long before TikTokers began speaking about her. Susanna's family was simply hoping that if they kept speaking out, the police would begin speaking out as well. They already had the report, but it felt like they weren't doing anything about it. Finally, on August 29th, over a month after Susanna vanished, the police released a statement about Susanna being missing. They claimed that detectives had exhausted all leads and that they needed the public's help. However, in that same statement, they said, and I quote, while any missing juvenile is considered endangered, at this time, there is no indication that Morales is in any specific danger, and it is not believed that she is being held against her will. And it really seems like the only reason they finally acknowledged it was because they couldn't ignore it anymore. Her family wasn't going to stop looking for her, and the public pressure was only growing with each social media post, article, and interview being posted. But the police's statement was disappointing, to say the least. They seemed to be downplaying the issue, and in my opinion, a 16-year-old missing for over a month with no sort of contact and a phone continuing to go to voicemail would indicate that something far more sinister may be going on. So I really don't get why that wasn't a major red flag and that foul play didn't seem as if it was being seriously looked into. Of course, it's common for teenagers, yes, to turn off their phones if they go out for the night and they aren't supposed to. But Susanna had clear permission to be out and she was heading in the direction of home on surveillance meaning she had no reason to turn her phone off. And also, most 16-year-olds wouldn't keep their phones off for over a month. They would turn it back on at some point to interact with their friends, scroll social media, and whatever else teenagers are doing on there. If their phone was dead, I can't imagine that a 16-year-old would willingly not charge it for over a month. Also, let's add in the fact that school had been in session for three and a half weeks by the time police finally decided to publicly acknowledge her being missing. So, what in the hell were they thinking? She had friends. She was a cheerleader. She was a good kid who had never just been a rebel and skipped school. Why did that not somehow alarm them? Make it make sense, because I just can't. Susanna's sister Jasmine did an interview the day after the police finally released a statement where she spoke about her beliefs compared to the police's and that surveillance footage. It's frustration of not knowing where she is, not knowing anything, you know? Like, all I ask sometimes is just, I just want to know where she's at so I can get her. For more than one month, Jasmine Morales has been praying for her younger sister's safe return home. Something happened in between the place that we got the camera footage from and our neighborhood, and that's like a minute apart. So something happened in that little minute, and just, we just haven't been able to figure out what happened. Gwinnett County Police initially considered Morales a runaway, but tell the love and alive it has exhausted all leads and now needs the public's help. It adds that there's no indication the teen is being held against her will, but her sister thinks otherwise. So we know that she's not out there because she wants to be. She will never do that. I mean, it's been over a month. It would have been like so she would have contacted at least her boyfriend, my mom, me, or at least. For the next few months, there was absolutely no new information. Each time people at the news station would follow up, the police would just say that they were following any leads. But there were no actual breakthroughs. Thanksgiving came and went. Christmas came and went. New Year's came and went. And no one heard from Susanna. And police did not release any more information. Throughout that time, her family, though, never gave up. They were constantly on the go, chasing any sort of leads that came their way, even ones that came from out of state. They were desperate. 
and they did not feel like they necessarily had the full support of the police department, which makes absolute sense based on how they responded to her family's pleas for help when she first went missing and even after that. But on the flip side, the police were claiming to be following up on every tip and lead themselves. Finally, in January of this year, they approached Susanna's family to get more information. With that, they simply asked for a DNA sample from her mom, Maria, and they also requested that they be given dental records. Dental records and DNA requests are often used to identify someone when they are found deceased. So naturally, that further increased the worry that Susanna's family was feeling, and they began to fear that police were no longer searching for a missing person, rather they were searching for a body. But no one was made aware of anything else until the beginning of February. On February 6th of 2023, a call came into the police from someone in a wooded area, and they believed that they had come across naked human remains. The area in question was over 20 miles from Norcross and was essentially on the Gwinnett County and Barrow County borders. Initially, police obviously did not have an identity and claimed that they were not sure about a foul play aspect. The news published stories about the human remains, which left the community speculating, but hoping that maybe it wasn't Susanna and that she was still alive. The day after they found the remains and before they even had an identity, police decided to do a grid search of the area to look for potential clues. While doing that grid search, they came across a gun near where the body had been found. The body they had found didn't appear to have been shot, though, in any manner. But obviously, that was an odd find, and they started to believe that it may have had something to do with the victim's death. The following day, on February 8, police announced that the human remains that were found were in fact Susanna's remains, and that they had been formally identified based on her dental records. Her family was beyond devastated. Not only were they dealing with just this incredible, aching amount of grief, but add in the layer that they had spent months begging and pleading to be taken seriously. They knew something bad had happened. They felt as if they were essentially ignored and time and time again. I can't even imagine the agony that they were in when they found this information out. But the big question was, who would do such a thing? Susanna didn't have any enemies that anyone knew of. She was kind, happy, she was loyal, and just a bright light. So why would anyone want to harm her? Who would harm her? Law enforcement was able to use their system and run the serial number of the gun that they had found. And that serial number traced back to 22-year-old Miles Bryant a former army member who was a police officer for the city of Doraville, which is just a town over from Norcross. Finding a fellow officer's gun near a crime scene was shocking in and of itself, but then they realized that the gun had been reported stolen at 11 a.m. on the 27th, just two hours after Susanna's disappearance was reported to the county police. Not only did Miles report his gun missing, but he also reported that his wallet and military ID had also been stolen. He had told officers that he had accidentally left his trunk open and someone got in and stole his things. Police quickly began working on putting together all of the information that they had gathered. Through their investigation, they found that Miles also lived at the Sterling Glen apartment complex. Now remember, the Sterling Glen complex was where Susanna's friend lived, where she had visited that day. Not only did Miles live there, but he was also a courtesy officer for the complex. And in a very weird, shocking twist, it was discovered that Susanna's home could even be seen from Miles' apartment. Too many things were not matching up, and on February 13th, Miles was arrested on charges of concealing a death and a false report of a crime. Police claimed that Miles had dumped Susanna's naked body in the woods. The report he made about his truck being broken into and the item stolen was deemed to be a false report. He was arrested at his apartment, and neighbors witnessed a bedsheet being taken out of his car before it was towed. Coincidentally, that happened to also be the same day as Susanna's funeral. Susanna's family allowed the Telemundo station to film her graveside service. But the night I was in 
Hearing Maria's cries was beyond heartbreaking. Immediately after his arrest, the city of Doraville, where Miles worked, released a statement saying the following, and I quote, The city of Doraville was notified the afternoon of Monday, February 13th, that a now former police officer was being served felony arrest warrants by the Gwinnett Police Department in connection with the disappearance and murder of Susanna Morales. The city of Doraville and its police department are fully cooperating with the Gwinnett Police Department in its investigation of Mr. Bryant. Our prayers rest with the family and friends of Susanna Morales and everyone else affected by this tragedy. Susanna's family was an absolute shock. They had no clue who Miles was prior to this. There is no known connection between him and Susanna. After the arrest, it didn't take long for people to begin speaking about previous and recent interactions that they had experienced with Miles. The first one was from a childhood friend who spoke to Fox 5 News on February 16th. I've known him since fifth grade. We grew up together. Elisha Bates now believes her childhood friend, former Doraville police officer Miles Bryant, stalked her at her Snellville apartment last year. She believes this ring video her neighbor gave her is Bryant as he lurked around her door, trying her knob, wearing a hood on his head. She says he even broke in one time when she was not home. Well, my neighbor told me that she saw Miles come into our community and listening to my door when I wasn't home and just trying to see if I was home messing with my doorknob and stuff she told me and once she showed me the video of him it was all alarming this stalking she says happened before 16 year old Susana Morales went missing in July and after the teen seemed to have vanished leaving Bates to think I was shocked I felt like it could have been me because he was the person at my door coming and unscrewing my knob and kicking it down and stuff like that in July she says it was a screen grab that led her to identify the man in the fatigues as Bryant a man she knew who tried to reconnect with her but she was not interested she says Bryant became so aggressive she feared for her life and reported the then police officer to his employer Doraville police and even Gwinnett police then did you go out and get a firearm because of him Yes. Doraville police say they launched an administrative investigation, talked to Bryant, and the behavior stopped. Doraville PD says they told Bates to report any potential criminal charges to Gwinnett police. Gwinnett says they are not sure why her complaints were not followed up on, but they are reopening her case. Miss Bates believes both police agencies dropped the ball. I don't think they took the matter serious because he was a cop. However, I do feel like if they did, Susanna could still be alive. So essentially, we just learned that all Miles got for his behavior was a little talking to. Over time, a total of four former female friends all accused Miles of breaking in or trying to break into their homes. One of them even said that he had stolen her underwear when he broke into her house in 2018, which is just beyond creepy and weird. Numerous police reports were filed, but no one ever really followed up on those reports, and Miles was still allowed to be a police officer despite them. On February 22nd, the Gwinnett Police Department held a press conference where they announced that Miles was being charged with kidnapping and murder. On July 26th at approximately 6 p.m., we know that Susanna Morales left her home on Santa Ana Drive in Norcross and walked a short distance to the Sterling Glen apartment complex on Indian Trail Road. There, she met with her friend for about four hours, and at about 10 o'clock, she began her trek back to her house. We know that between 10 and 10.30 p.m., uh, Susanna had an interaction with an individual and ultimately was not seen or heard from again. This case was immediately assigned to our Criminal Investigations Division, who worked diligently on this case and followed up on a number of leads and tips. However, those leads and tips did not come to fruition. We know that on February the 6th, a citizen who was walking in the area of Drowning Creek Road and Highway 316 happened upon skeletal remains. The Gwinnett County Police Department sealed that crime scene the crime scene, or correction, the uh, Gwinnett County Medical Examiner took custody of those remains and they were positively identified as having belonged to Susanna Morales. The following morning, February 7th, 
Uh, we brought out a large contingency of police personnel and conducted a methodical and meticulous search known as a grid search. And during that search, we located a firearm that had been reported stolen on um, July 27th. This is the same day that Susanna was reported missing. That firearm we traced back to a 22-year-old former Dorville police officer named Miles Bryant. Bryant then became a person of interest in our case. We continue investigating, and on February 13th, we secured warrants for concealing the death of another. Since that time, our criminal investigators have been working uh, this case continuously, and we have reached a threshold to where these charges have now been upgraded to felony murder and kidnapping charges. I would like to thank the Gwinnett County District Attorney's Office for their assistance, along with the Doral Police Department. Miles appeared in court on the 23rd to be read his charges and was given no bond with the judge citing that he was a danger to the community, which, uh, yes, obviously. In early March, he was charged with burglary for a 2019 incident as well. A woman who he had attended high school with had her home broken into when she was gone and caught someone walking around on her surveillance camera. She reported it to the police, but they eventually closed the case. After Miles was arrested for his crimes against Susanna and she saw him, she was confident that he was the one who broke into her home and she went back to the police and told them. She also let them know that she had never given him her address. There ended up being enough evidence to charge him. On May 1st, he returned back to court. And this time, he was asking for a bond reduction. The prosecution was well prepared with their argument, though. Good morning. Are you Miles Bryant? How you doing, ma'am? Yeah, okay. Is that a yes? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. As Bryant entered the courtroom handcuffed with his waist shackled, one of his family members broke down in tears and walked out of the courtroom. The prosecution then described incidents of Bryant using his position of power as a Doraville police officer to commit, quote, sexually deviant acts, including breaking into women's homes and stealing their underwear, and on one occasion accessing a woman's phone to steal sexual videos. While he was on duty and in uniform, asked her to utilize her cell phone because he needed to log into his bank. And instead of doing so, he accessed her videos and sent himself videos of conducting sexual activity on her phone. While Miles' attorney tried to argue why he should be allowed a reduced bond, the judge denied the request and made it clear that he would be staying in jail. The police believed that Susanna was killed sometime between 10 p.m. on the 26th and 2 a.m. on the 27th. Unfortunately, going off of that timeline means that by the time Susanna's family went to the police, she had already been murdered. But sadly enough, to this day, they still do not know how she was murdered, leaving her family to question what exactly happened to Susanna. The only thing law enforcement has shared regarding her cause of death is that they do not believe she was shot. However, they do believe that Susanna was likely harmed and violated in a sexual manner and then killed before her body was disposed of in the woods. While the timeline shows the police department likely could not have stopped the murder of Susanna, there is no doubt that the police seemingly dropped the ball on this case and she could have possibly been found a lot sooner had her disappearance been taken seriously. Police enforced their own 48-hour rule with Susanna's case, and according to Title 35 of the Georgia Code, that is prohibited. 
The code states, and I quote, no law enforcement agency shall implement a policy or practice which mandates a minimum waiting period before initiating a missing person report with such agency, provided, however, that it shall remain within the discretion of the law enforcement agency to determine what action, if any, is required in response to such a report. So that essentially means that the police department was wrong to refuse to make a report until the 48-hour mark. As if that isn't bad enough, I truly believe that there is no reason it should have taken Gwinnett Police a month to publicly speak on the disappearance of Susanna. We all know that teenagers often run away, but Susanna's family had all the evidence to prove that running away was completely out of character for her and not something that she would have ever done. The surveillance footage showed she also was heading toward her home. The fact that her phone pinged in the opposite direction without her ever being seen on surveillance for a second time should have been concerning enough. The fact that she missed three and a half weeks of school and her phone was never turned on should have been concerning enough for them to look into foul play and do actual searches. And aside from the Gwinnett Police Department, Susanna's family also holds the Doraville Police Department responsible for how they handled their hiring process. Their family attorney recently spoke to 11 Alive News regarding the issues. The family's attorney, Alex Northover, says Doraville police failed to take corrective action ahead of time. There were multiple indications that that this individual um, presented a danger. Um, There was a previous allegation of stalking. Northover says the city of Doraville should take accountability. He says he's talked with officials during an ongoing criminal and civil investigation. Take responsibility for their role in this tragic incident and take measures to make sure that this doesn't happen again. To do that, Northover says it's time for a change when it comes to the process of bringing in new officers. Increased hiring, screening procedures, adequate training. The case for Miles Bryant is still ongoing, and I'm sure it will be for a while. My hope is that in the end, justice is served for Susanna and Miles will never be able to harm anyone again. This case raises a lot of questions and concerns within the county. Specifically, many of the residents are questioning how the cases related to missing children of color are treated in their community. There have been a few Hispanic children who have gone missing, and many members of the county do not feel as if they were taken seriously. Susanna's family actually did a panel about it in Gwinnett County. As a parent, there's nothing more terrifying than having your child go missing. But as a mother, a woman who has carried and birthed that child into this world, that is a pain beyond expression. And the devastation that follows the discovery that your missing child was murdered is unspeakable. For all the parents in this audience, pause right now and imagine the worst. Your baby goes missing for a day, seven days, 14 days, a month, two months, seven months, and then one day, Police contact you asking for a DNA sample, and your child turns up in literal pieces. That's what this mother and sister went through. The family of Susana Morales. We're here today because there has never been a just America. There has never been equality and justice for all. And there has been no life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for this family. And it's not just for that county. In Washington, D.C., there are still dozens of unsolved missing cases related to black and brown girls under the age of 21. Families like Susanna's come to America for the very thing that we just can't seem to offer them. Peace and safety. 
There is nothing natural about a parent losing a child. But for a parent to have to bypass that grief in order to have the stamina to fight for justice for that child, that is an unconscionable act. And yet, that's exactly the new reality for Maria Brown and Jasmine Morales. I'm curious to hear your guys' thoughts on this case, too. Do you believe that the police dropped the ball? Do you believe that they should have gone public about Susanna's case sooner? Do you think that they didn't follow up on the previous stalking claims because he was an officer and therefore his behavior was just overlooked? And do you think that the kidnapping and murder of Susanna was planned? Or was it a crime of opportunity? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. This case, like I said, just infuriated me the way it was handled. Although I am happy that Susanna's family was able to finally recover her, was able to grieve, and was able to start the process of getting whatever type of closure they would be able to get. I'm going to be following this case and I will provide updates later regarding Miles, so make sure to check back if you haven't subscribed to the channel already. Please take a quick second to do so. That way, when you sign into YouTube, you won't miss any of my true crime videos or updates. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in, and until the next case, stay safe.